episode 54. Chapter 13, Detention with Dolores. Dinner in the Great Hall that night was not a pleasant experience for Harry. The news about his shouting match with Umbridge seemed to have traveled exceptionally fast, even by Hogwarts standards. He heard whispers all around him as he sat eating between Ron and Hermione. The funny thing was that none of the whisperers seemed to mind him overhearing what they were saying about him. On the contrary, it was as though they were hoping he would get angry and start shouting again so they could hear his story firsthand. He says he saw Cedric Diggory murdered. He reckons he deals with you-know-who. Come off it. How does he think he's kidding? Her lies. What I don't get, said Harry in a shaking voice, laying down his knife and fork. His hands were trembling too much to hold them steady. What I don't get is why they all believed the story two months ago when Dumbledore told them. Well, the thing is, Harry, I'm not sure they did said Hermione grimly. Oh, let's get out of here. She slammed down her own knife and fork. Ron looked sadly at his half-finished apple pie, but followed suit. People stared at them all the way out of the hall. What do you mean you're not sure they believe Dumbledore? Harry asked Hermione when they reached the first floor landing. Look, you don't understand what it was like after it happened, said Hermione quietly. You arrived back in the middle of the lawn, clutching Cedric's dead body. None of us saw what happened in the maze. We just had Dumbledore's word for it that you know who had come back and killed Cedric and fought you. Which is the truth, said Harry loudly. I know it is, Harry. So will you please stop biting my head off, said Hermione wearily. It's just that before the truth could sink in, Everyone went home for the summer, where they spent two months reading about how you're a nutcase and Dumbledore's going senile. Rain pounded on the window panes as they strode along the empty corridors back to Gryffindor Tower. Harry felt as though his first day had lasted a week, but he still had a mountain of homework to do before bed. A dull, pounding pain was developing over his right eye. He glanced out of a rain-washed window at the dark grounds as they turned into the fat lady's corridor. There was still no light in Hagrid's cabin. Mimulus Mimblatonia, said Hermione, before the fat lady could ask. The portrait swung open to reveal the hole behind, and the three of them scrambled back through it. The common room was almost empty. Nearly everyone was still down at dinner. Crookshanks uncoiled himself from an armchair and trotted to meet them, purring loudly. And when Harry, Ron, and Hermione took their three favorite chairs at the fireside, he leapt lightly into Hermione's lap and curled up there like a furry ginger cushion. Harry gazed into the flames, feeling drained and exhausted. How can Dumbledore have let this happen? Hermione cried suddenly, making Harry and Ron jump. Crookshanks leapt off her, looking affronted. She pounded the arms of her chair in fury so that bits of the stuffing leaked out of the holes. How can he let that terrible woman teach us, and in our owl year, too? Well, we've never had a great defense against the dark arts teacher, have we? said Harry. You know what it's like. Hagrid told us nobody wants the job. They say it's jinxed. Yes, but to employ someone who's actually refusing to let us do magic. What's Dumbledore playing at? And she's trying to get people to spy for her, said Ron darkly. Remember when she said she wanted us to come back and tell her if we hear anyone saying you know who's back? Well, of course she's here to spy on us. That's obvious. Why else would Fudge have wanted her to come? snapped Hermione. Don't start arguing again said Harry wearily as Ron opened his mouth to retaliate. Can't we just, let's just do that homework, get it out of the way. They collected their school bags from a corner and returned to the chairs by the fire. People were coming back from dinner now. 
Harry kept his face averted from the portrait hole, but could still sense the stares he was attracting. Shall we do Snipe stuff first? said Ron, dipping his quill into his ink. The properties of Moonstone and its uses in potion making, he muttered, writing the words across the top of his parchment as he spoke them. There, he underlined the title, then looked up expectantly at Hermione. So, what are the properties of Moonstone and its uses in potion making? But Hermione was not listening. She was squinting over into the far corner of the room where Fred, George, and Lee Jordan were now sitting at the center of a knot of innocent-looking first years, all of whom were chewing something that seemed to have come out of a large paper bag that Fred was holding. No, I'm sorry, they've gone too far, she said, standing up and looking positively furious. Come on, Ron. I, what? said Ron, plainly playing for time. No, come on, Hermione. We can't tell them off for giving out sweets. You know perfectly well that those are bits of nosebleed nougat or puking pastilles or... Fainting fancies, Harry suggested quietly. One by one, as though hit over the heads with invisible mallets, the first years were slumping unconscious in their seats. Some slid right onto the floor. Others merely hung over the arms of their chairs, their tongues lolling out. Most of the people watching were laughing. Hermione, however, squared her shoulders and marched directly over to where Fred and George now stood with clipboards, closely observing the unconscious first years. Ron rose halfway out of his chair, hovered uncertainly for a moment or two, then muttered to Harry, "'She's got it under control.' before sinking as low in his chair as his lanky frame permitted. That's enough, Hermione said forcefully to Fred and George, both of whom looked up in mild surprise. Yeah, you're right, said George, nodding. This dosage looks strong enough, doesn't it? I told you this morning you can't test your rubbish on students. We're paying them, said Fred indignantly. I don't care. It could be dangerous. Rubbish, said Fred. Come down, Hermione, they're fine, said Lee, reassuringly as he walked from first year to first year, inserting purple sweets into their open mouths. Yeah, look, they're coming round now, said George. A few of the first years were indeed stirring. Several looked so shocked to find themselves lying on the floor or dangling off their chairs that Harry was sure Fred and George had not warned them what the sweets were going to do. Feel all right, said George kindly to a small, dark-haired girl lying at his feet. Uh, I think so, she said shakily. Excellent, said Fred happily. But the next second, Hermione had snatched both his clipboard and the paper bag of fainting fancies from his hands. It is not excellent. Of course it is. They're alive, aren't they? said Fred irritably. You can't do this. What if you made one of them really ill? We're not going to make them ill. We've already tested them all on ourselves. This is just to see if everyone reacts the same. If you don't stop doing it, I'm going to put us in detention, said Fred in an I'd like to see you try it voice. Make us write lines, said George, smirking. Onlookers all over the room were laughing. Hermione drew herself up to her full height. Her eyes narrowed and her bushy hair seemed to crackle with electricity. No, she said, her voice quivering with anger, but I will write to your mother. You wouldn't, said George, horrified, taking a step back from her. Oh, yes, I would said Hermione grimly. I can't stop you eating these stupid things yourselves, but you're not giving them the first years. Fred and George looked thunderstruck. It was clear that as far as they were concerned, Hermione's threat was way below the belt. With a last threatening look at them, she thrust Fred's clipboard and the bag of fancies back into his arms and stalked back to her chair by the fire. Ron, was now so low in his seat that his nose was roughly level with his knees. 
Thank you for your support, Ron, Hermione said acidly. You handled it fine by yourself, Ron mumbled. 